limits are in your mind. Those things of which you, where you reach were a part where you think you can't go. And the Marines are always learning that when you think you're at your last, you can always do one more. And that always do one more mentality means you're going to keep pushing. And so I got that from my coaches as well, right? To, to practice and to kind of hone skills and always be willing to put your best effort forward. Because again, even if it's not good enough, right? Even some days you're not going to be good. Your best isn't going to be good enough. But you have to understand and know that that experience means you learn from it and you come back stronger. And you come back stronger each time. Welcome to the Legacy Project. My name is Jim Koppel, president of the Servant Ford Foundation. We're an organization committed to leadership development with a specific focus on service. This podcast and its related activities are about sharing the legacy we have inherited and discussing the legacy we still want to create. Legacy is more than cars, houses, boats, and material possessions that we want to leave to the next generation. Other legacy is about core values and beliefs that we inherited from a previous generation. They are the values that shaped us and defined us. Legacy is also about the values we develop or create that can be passed on or shared with the next generation. We will interview people from various backgrounds and walks of life. Some are famous, some, well, maybe not so famous, and others are simply our neighbors, our friends, people who live ordinary lives doing extraordinary things. Become part of this project by being intentional about legacy, more than just memories, but principles that have guided our lives and shaped our decisions. What is the legacy you choose to create? That's what we want to discover. Well, we're fortunate today to be talking with Sergeant Jermaine Harris of the Chicago, City of Chicago Police Department, and uh, Sergeant Harris is an Area 4 of the City of Chicago, which covers the 15th, 10th, and 11th districts, one of the more violent areas of Chicago. And uh, uh, how long have you been with the police department, Jermaine? Um, so I'm going into my 18th year uh, with the Chicago 18th. Police Department. Great. Are you from Chicago? Uh, yes. I'm actually, I have the fortunate ability of being able to actually police and work and serve in the same neighborhood I grew up in. That's fantastic. So you have, you have a lot of relationships to build on and experience in that area. Yeah, absolutely. From even from friends. So one of the things that in, in living on the West side and, you know, being born and raised here. So when I talk about things that are going on in neighborhoods and, and I talk about community, I'm actually speaking about my friends and my family, right? People who are close to me. Yeah, that's great. It is so tempting in this podcast where we're really focused in the legacy project on individual journeys is that we could probably get sidetracked into talking about policing, and I'll try to avoid that <laughs> as much as possible, though it's part of both of our lives, and so I'm sure it's going to intersect. When you uh, you grew up in Chicago, uh, who were some of the more most influential people in your life? Who were the people that influenced and shaped your values and your commitment? Yeah, I think one of the most influential people was my granddad. Um, so as a teenager, we had some trouble um, within the family financially, and which we had to kind of move and live around with different relatives and different family. Um, and we landed, uh, my mom and my, my two sisters and I landed uh, at my granddad's home um, going into my freshman year of high school. And what happened with that was that I had that... Um, that older, wiser voice, you know, in my life uh, for the first time. And I think it was great doing a form doing formidable, formidable years like that. And what would happen is he would talk with me and share stories about his experience. So he's a veteran and he would talk about his time during the Korean War and just the racism he faced, the struggles he encountered as being a black uh, soldier in the army, but then also how he came home and was able to make a successful life for himself. And so part of that really is what led me personally to becoming a Marine, um, just hearing those stories about just the strength that he, he received from the military. And that was a really big, big thing in my life. And, and, and secondly, it was my coaches in sports. Uh, and one of the things of, uh, just about athletics that really saved um, it was a lot of like what saves you and what makes a difference in growing up in these in these spaces. And, you know, so growing up in the 90s in Chicago, gangs and violence and drugs and all of that was around me. Right. I was surrounded by it. But one of the things that kept me away from it was sports. And so my coaches would 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 
offer that guidance and, you know, not wanting to, to upset them, not want to, you know, mess up my playing time. And so they would kind of like set those standards on me. And, and it was really the, all the intangible things that came from athletics that, that's so important to me. And not just the winning the game or learning how to be a great athlete, but it was the, the, the social connections, the leadership, you know, learning how to be accountable. Like all of these different skill sets you build through competition, it was really, really important in my life. And I'm so grateful for having that opportunity. So were you ever tempted or pulled in uh, to the drug culture or, or the uh, negative behavior that might be around you? Yeah. So that was the thing. I was lucky to escape that because I had adults that wouldn't let it happen. So I had the adults in my life from my mom, uh, who was all about school. You're not, you don't have time for those things. And then to my coaches, who would, I didn't have time. I had practice and they would try to wear me out. So when I got home, it was time to go to bed. And so that was one of the things that just now as I look into working with youth, is, which is my passion, I try to recreate that experience I had for them. And one of the dreams of mine is to be able, when you, when you look at the refrigerator, right? I know some of us who, who kind of grew up and there's a calendar on it. And each day of the week, you had all these different activities, right? Karate today, art the next day, you know, band or whatever it may be. And so it really became my dream to recreate that for kids on the West Side, to fill their calendars up with activities so that they, they would stay safe and, and, and you know, and grow up with, with a, real, a well-rounded experience. So when you think of the influence of your grandfather, that's a relationship. What were some of the values that he instilled in you uh, that, that you captured and you held on to? I think one of, at the time, I don't think I realized it. But now in just thinking back, it was courage, right? And specifically, courageous leadership. Because he went through things, right, that, that without having that strong will or without having that, that courage and ability to stand up, that may, it could have broken him or he could have folded, right? And so in, in knowing how to speak up and, and to do what's right and emulate that in your life, like every step you take, as a young person, may not have realized that, but as I reflect and understand and saw what he went through, and it became so crucial into just my own experiences and what I do now. I try to do, to do that from professionally, from personally, but being able to kind of go out there and do those things that are most important, even in, a, in, in the face of uh, maybe a little embarrassment or, or maybe being outcasted from a particular culture. But I think it's important to be able to do that because without those type of leaders and without these kind of people in the world, I don't know where we would be as far as advancing and reform and making a difference and transformation. All of those things are extremely crucial to have courage. Would you say that he taught you risk taking what, that goes with courage? That you're willing to take some risks? Oh, absolutely. That has to be it. And there's no way if you're not if you're not out there uh, a little nervous about uh, on some thin ice, I don't think you're doing it right. Right. We have we have to be prepared to push to push those things because so much of status quo has hurt um, communities and hurt people. And so it really takes it takes people that will that will go out and take some chances for the for the to make that sacrifice. Again, one of those important things to make a sacrifice for the greater good. What about your coaches? What did you learn from them? Uh, from them, from coaches are similar. My coaching experience and my Marine experience are actually somewhat similar. Coaches, the tough coaches and the drill instructors, <laughs> they have a lot in common. They have a lot in common. Uh, but it's really that thing of knowing and understanding what limits me, right? Limits are in your mind. Those things in which you, where you reach were a part where you think you can't go. And the Marines are always learning that when you think you're at your last, you can always do one more. And that always do one more mentality means you're going to keep pushing. And so I got that from my coaches as well, right, to to practice and to kind of hone skills and always be willing to put your best effort forward, forward. Because, again, even if it's not good enough, right, even some days you're not going to be good. Your best isn't going to be good enough. But you have to understand and know that that experience means you learn from it and you come back stronger and you come back stronger each time. And so I really learned that process, you know, through sports. And when I got to the Marines, even though it was really hard, I think I foundationally, I understood what that meant. So I kind of grasped and got into it a little quicker. And I had a very successful uh, military career. I, I received um, two meritorious promotions. I graduated number one in my boot camp class. I finished number one in my, um, in my A school training, that's where you kind of learn your particular um, specialty. So I finished number one in both of those and got um, meritorious promotions from it. And in my four years there, I made it to E5, a sergeant in the Marine Corps. And it was just really, and just always just, just pushing and, and, and keeping myself to a high standard. 
Did you serve overseas? Um, no, so I, I served in from ninety seven to two thousand one. And the interesting thing about my um, yeah. about my my marine career is that my final day was on a Tuesday in two thousand one. That happened to yeah. be in September. Yeah, so nine oh, eleven was actually my final day as a marine. I was actually due to fly home from California to Chicago that morning, and to find out that no flights are going to be going. You know, we're, we're West Coast, so we're a little bit behind. Um, in the time, so kind of waking up and discovering and seeing that, um, seeing those buildings on fire, um, was was kind of was my I guess uh, a release or saying goodbye from the Marine Corps was kind of walking into that world. So that's why I came into civilian life in post nine eleven. Yeah, you went to school. Where did you go to school? Um, so. I, so being on the west side of Chicago and just understanding a little bit about that neighborhood and, and the community there, so it's, it's synonymous with violence and drugs, but there's also a lot of great people. And with that, one of those great people was my mom, of course, right? <laughs> and so she really pressed education on me. And so I, was, I had a, an amazing opportunity to go to high school at uh, one of the best schools in Chicago. It's um, Michelle Obama's, um, oh. uh, is, is our famous uh, alum, alumni. Um, so it's Whitney Young. It was a it was a magnet school. So p basically, what it was, it took the model of taking kids from a different bunch of different communities, and bringing them all together into kind of one space. So I had amazing um, experiences in diversity and just learning and seeing different things that I didn't have in my own neighborhood. And what that really taught me was that I saw and understood a certain ceiling that I thought existed in my life of like where I could go, and that was pretty much it. By looking at other people and professions and careers around me. But walking into a place like that, I realized that these, these ceilings didn't exist, right? And as hard as you wanted to work and, 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 and as best you wanted to apply yourself and take advantage of opportunities, that, you know, the sky was the limit. And it really became an understanding of what opportunities meant. Because had I not been afforded that, I don't think I would be in this place today. And so, again, that becomes one of the other things that kind of drives me to really create opportunities and, and deal with access within my own community now. Did you have a chance to go to college? Um, so I am, I am an adult learner. So I went straight yeah. to the Marine Corps after, um, after high school. And I didn't take my first college class until I was 30 years old. And, oh, now, okay. and now at this point, I have a bachelor's now in criminal justice. And I have a master's in public safety uh, administration as well. So I'm, I'm proof that it's never too late to get yeah. back in school. And, and, and I think it was an important thing, too, with my own kids as they kind of prepare to enter their, their, their college li lives, I wanted to make sure if I'm going to tell them to do something, I better, be, better not be saying something I wouldn't do myself. So now I had that kind of, that weight to hold over them, right, as I pushed them, yeah, right. push them forward. So, yeah. So how many kids do you have? Um, I have, so I always say t technically I have, they're not kids because they're, now they're big, right? But yeah. I, have two, <laughs> I have two children there. My daughter is 22 years old. She wow. she graduated last year during the pandemic with a major majoring in accounting. She's doing really great. She she landed a job with with Allstate, you know, doing her accounting work. And then my son is now a senior in high school. He's um he's graduating this year and looking for colleges. And so we're going through that, you know, through a lot of that, uh, trying to figure out what school he's going to go to. And he's also an athlete too, right? That same type of thing and pushing my kids. My daughter was a softball player. My my son well is a softball player, saying was right, and my son is a is a baseball player, so he's trying to find a, a college where he can get a great education and also play a little baseball. But you know, during this pandemic, he lost two years right yeah. of, of, of sports with not being able to play. But I think he'll I think he'll do good. Yeah. So I mean, you you inherited a tremendous set of values in terms of your relationship with your own children. How have you transmitted values, or what have been, what's been important to you? or your kids to learn uh, about legacy, about the legacy you've inherited, the legacy you're creating. Uh, what's been critical in your relationship with your children about legacy? Yeah, so one of the things through modeling myself, but also conversations with them, is the importance of giving back and the importance of being the change you wanna see. And so by that, it's, it's like in our neighborhood, right? So, so often, you know, kids are taught to work hard, to study, to get great grades so that they can escape, right? It's always being taught as a place you need to leave. So what's going on is that our best talent, our greatest thinkers, our most amazing assets are all going to different communities and helping to benefit and helping them flourish. 
So what I wanted to do really in that understanding of legacy was to, within myself, but also as I talk to my own, my own kids, is that the greatness has to stay in communities to help spread and to help build and to help open these doors and create these these access opportunities. So now I currently live in North Lawndale. It's one of the, you know, it's one of the communities when you look at violence, it's one of the top five violent communities. It's one of the top five communities of opioid overdose, overdoses. It's a, it's a community where in the city of Chicago, when you live on the west side in the community where I am, means that you're going to die 10 years before everyone else. So a lot of these issues and the, these social ills that are kind of going on in this place is going to take leaders and it's going to take people to help up to, to build it up. And so what I try to do is important that I stay here because I wanted to be on an, on a school, you know, on a local school council that affects the West Side. I wanted to be able to shop at businesses that help benefit the West Side. And so and, and you know, the opportunity is there. Could I leave and go to a different community? You know, I'm a police officer. I make a, a, a decent salary. I could absolutely leave. But I don't think that's that helps. And I don't think that makes transformation. So I chose to raise my kids here in the same community that I'm from so that they learn and understand that as they grow and achieve success, they're going to come back and, and help someone else and kept, keep passing that on. And I think that's one of the things that's that's missing in a lot of ways when we teach that kind of escape mentality and rather than an asset building mentality. And so that's one of the things that, that I really try to push at them is to build assets and kind of stay here and watch and stick it through. Be, be long term investors and let's see this thing change and turn around. Faith is important to you. Oh, absolutely. Uh, talk to me about that legacy, uh, the legacy of faith that you've inherited and the legacy of faith that you're living. All right. So growing, so growing up, um, my, my grandmother was a part of the, the Great Migration coming from the South, uh, both my grandparents coming from the South up, up to Chicago. And so with that came that Southern religion, that Baptist kind of uh, upbringing. Yeah. <laughs> so being raised in the church was my existence, right? It would be, you know, putting up, putting your, your church clothes, your good shoes on and your good, you know, your good yeah. church clothes on every Sunday and going to Bible classes and just being around that experience of what that meant. One of the important things you learn through that process is just what community was about and being together, right? Just that, that, that engagement and, 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 and having leadership you're seeing there and different people activating in so many ways. And so that was just what I grew up in and kind of we came what, what life was about. And with that, I understood and I learned about, you know, things you can control, things you, things you have to leave up to God, right? Things you have to trust in. And I think that's what makes it possible to do a dangerous job like being a police officer, right? I can't go in worrying about what may happen and what may come next. I just have to leave my faith in God and knowing that I'm gonna be on the path or be where I'm supposed to be. And that the comfort that comes from that, I think helps with the bravery and the courage and all those things that are required to do dangerous jobs is that I can really fully give of myself knowing that the outcome will be exactly you know, what God shows it to be. And I find so much comfort and solace in just being able to kind of move and, and, and think that way. So how have all these different streams of influences from the Marine Corps, your grandfather, coaching, et cetera, how has that influence or shaped what it is that you do today as a police officer working in Area 4? Uh, how, how does that legacy influence your, your actions, your motivation? What drives you into this work? Yeah. I think, I think the big thing that I that I get from, you know, all of those experiences, is really just understanding um, how these relationships and how everything kind of inter interconnects. Is because I believe I can put myself in the in the shoes of so many people I connect with. Right? It's that connectability and relatability that is so crucial to the work I do in community policing. Because myself, like I spent my entire life growing up, always being one decision away from either being a victim or an offender. And knowing and understanding like that, you know, how small that, that line is, right? And so now going forward, I try to understand that in every connection and every interaction I make, because I can see myself in every kid. I can see myself in every man. I can see my mom in every, every mom. And, and you know, in that way, and I, I try to personalize it that way and act as if, you know, I know this is, you know, this is thing we learn as a kid, right? The whole golden rule, do unto others as you would like them do unto you. But I kind of take it even to a step further as, as I do unto others as I would like 
someone to do to my mom or my dad or my grandmother. So I try to personalize it that way uh, into, into what I do. And so I'm extremely comfortable with giving power, the power of decision making to other people because how crucial and important that is, especially being an authority figure at, at, within policing, like so much of it is about that, that power and that authority. And what is the greatest thing ever is to be able to give that to people to make decisions for themselves. And what the empowerment comes from that and just the ability to kind of decide your own fate, what that does to uplift people has been tremendous. And, 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 and I think it's, it's infectious as well because as you do it one time, right, and you see the benefits of being able to build something your own and, 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 to be, and play a, a crucial role in it, you want to do it again and you want to do it again. And I think it inspires um, people in, in a lot of ways by just having that power to make decisions. You're a young man, so this question may be tough. <laughs> but when it's all said, but yet you work in a dangerous profession. So let me ask this question. Uh, when it's all said and done, and uh, you know Stephen Covey in his book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, talks about living with the end in mind. Uh, if people were uh, go to your funeral, what do you want them to say about you? What would you uh, want the people around you to say about Jermaine Harris? Yeah. So one of the, the important things that I talk to young people a lot and I kind of speak to them about these three core areas in your life of, of human interaction. One is the expectations, impressions and reputation. Right. To talk about how each of those words and what they mean as far as the expectations being a lot of those things and, and that, that manifest in stereotype and bias and, and a lot in maybe in, in, in racial profiling. A lot of these expectations of people that what they think about you without really knowing you just by looking at you. And then the impressions you make, right? This is when you can start to control. Like when you go out and, and as you interact and how you behave and the level of respect you, you give out and just all of these interactions of how important these impressions are. But I think the final thing becomes the most important thing that you must guard and protect, and that's your reputation. That's how you perform over, over time, over a series of engagements, over a series of encounters. And that's that thing that, that you should protect um, you know, and, and keep most close to you. So, so at my funeral, really, I want that it to be about that reputation where people have had a list and a series of times that they've encountered me and just countless stories about ways that we've had either had fun together, we've cried together, we've built things together, but over time, right? Not just an anecdote, right? Not just this one story, but a whole list of cache of stories that, that they can kind of draw from. And so I really try to build that out. And a lot of times I run out of time in a day, right? Because I'm trying so much to, to, to kind of be able to touch and do as much as I can, but it's just, it's just, Having this ability to connect with people and having this ability to, to, to kind of to transform things is something that you can't waste. And it comes, it's a huge, huge responsibility. And I even talk one of those things and talking with, as we kind of share things with our children. That's one of the things I, I share and I talk with my son so, so much about is that, you know, you're smart. You're going to a good school. Um, you have a chance to, to really be successful in life. And so now you're stuck with it. You got a responsibility that comes with that. And you can't slack off and you can't chill and you can't relax, even though you want to. Well, you can't because you've had an opportunity that, that's been given to you that many people don't. That there's a lot of guys and girls that are, that are in our neighborhood that have never had opportunities you had. So you can't squander them. And so in just in, in kind of moving that way and thinking about the, 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 the reputation that I leave um, with people at my funeral, that's just that one thing. And I, wanna, I want a lot of stories <laughs> that, that can feed yeah. like that evidence. I want, a lot of, I want some evidence-based uh, funeral. I want one of those type of things. Yeah. So, so, yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's, a good, that's a good line. I mean, yeah. steal that. Evidence-based funeral. <laughs> So let me ask you this. I, th that prompted a memory in my own past. When my father died, uh, where there, I have uh, two brothers and two sisters, and the whole family, grandchildren, everybody sat in a circle and told stories about my father, who was a World War II veteran, a very colorful figure. Uh, but I discovered in that storytelling that my daughters were raised by one dad and the sons were raised by another. <laughs> and that is... The way he responded. Do you find yourself you're you're both a a, a boy dad and a girl dad? Uh, do you find yourself uh, or do your kids perceive how you relate to them differently? 
Um, so I'm very conscious of that. So one of the important things that I do is to try to encourage strength in my daughter. Um, but the same way in my son, it looks, it plays out in different ways, right? And to, to kind of deal in, in dealing with those things. And so one of the important parts, I think I actually, in thinking back, I might, I might pour more into my daughter than my yeah. son, you know, one of those things, right? And I think it may be the op- sometimes the opposite yeah. where it plays out, but it was very important to me that she really understood her strength and her value. And she really understands that, you know, she can do anything. Right. And it's no limitations, again, on her being a, you know, being a girl or a woman or a young lady, you know, those kind of things that that she she's able to achieve, you know, anything and how smart and just how important and beautiful and all, you know, all of those great positive um, attributes, attributes that she understands that they're in her. So it was really important for that one. With my son, I think I, I gave him more of this toughness of trying to uh, the marine in me a little bit kind of played out more in him yeah. um with just that that sh- that the, through strength and kind of perseverance and, and those kind of things so i actually coached him growing up uh. from the time he was uh, a t-baller peewee football player i coached him all the way up until he got to high school so those was one of those great opportunities too that i got to kind of watch him grow um you know in in sports and spend so much time with him but also with his peers and so he has a core group of friends that I played a role, right, in, in their upbringing. And so I could trust them to be together and, you know, and, and to be able to him have someone that, that kind of has similar experiences. But my daughter was right along. Um, she, she was my assistant coach and she kept score. She can keep score in almost any sport and stats and all of that stuff. She's a whiz at doing those type of things. She might coach. I don't know. But, um, but it was just a great family experience, right, through sports and just having everyone out. Um, together and play these different roles but um but it's just just in thinking back I'd have to reflect a little bit more maybe we have to talk to them and ask them too they might have a totally different account of of how I was so right yeah because I know in my experience when my brothers and I talked about my dad it was one sort of set of values and stories and my sisters had a completely different set we kind of looked at each other who are you (laughs) and how did this happen yeah, you know, we all have uh, symbols in our life. Or I, I look at my desk this morning and I see icons or symbols of my past. Um, from your inheritance or your background and your legacy, uh, if and, and th- this question comes from a line of a movie uh, called Leap Year, that if your house were to catch on fire and you were to run from your house, aside from your family and your pets, what's the one thing you would want to grab? or sees that uh, reflects who you are and what you're about? Hmm. That's a tough one. I'm, I'm one of those people that are, that's a min, a minimalist, right? Uh-huh. That has, <laughs> that has really, that doesn't have a lot of things that are around. So, so I would have to really think about that because, so one of the things to kind of really also consider is that experience. I mentioned um, earlier about my grandmothers and my grand, grand grandparents yeah. um, as part of the great migration. So their experiences, they came up here with my young, my, my youngest grandmother, I don't know what was that, but, but my, my mom's grandmother um, coming up here as a toddler, right, mm-hmm. with nothing, with her, her siblings, uh, both her parents had passed away, and so the siblings came to Chicago for better opportunities to escape racism and other issues and segregation in the South, but she came up here as a toddler with nothing. Right. And so it's in just rebuilding and growing and creating a legacy just from scratch in so many ways. And and so having that history, right, of thinking back and I know and, and I hear stories of of, of kind of other other cultures will talk about things that were passed down in these heirlooms and to understand that we really don't have those type of things. Right. Just because of the experiences, um, the experience, just the experiences culturally that we had. So that kind of influences a little bit of my minimalism, right? Of not just not having things um, physically uh, that that I could, that I would cherish or value in that way. So it's a tough thing to think about. I, you gotta you got me with that one, and just yeah. in thinking about what's the <laughs> item because it's because it, it, yeah. in all honesty, though the, those things are I've learned too that you know to, with risk taking that if you were to lose everything. You can yeah. just you could start over and rebuild yeah. it, and it's just that that's one of the the greatest things about about America, right? That's one of the greatest things with our country, is that that having that that will and that understanding and a little bit of those instructions and roadmap, you can recreate 
you know, experiences and you could start over many times, right? So many of our most successful people have lost everything and start and started over, you know, repeatedly. And I think that part there makes it comfortable with me to not have a lot or have things and even come the way I came up is one of the, just as an experience, um, when I talked about how we ended up, you know, staying with my granddad, we were evicted from our home. And in possessions, right, all those things I had in the world were sitting on a lawn, right? And in front of the block. And so that embarrassment and just, just realizing that we had to go and there was no way to take that stuff and no way to keep it. And so we lost a lot of things and had to kind of start over again. And so, so much of that plays into, into just, in, just in thinking about things that I can have and hold. And so I really try to and ensure it's the things that I can keep inside, right? Those things that can't be touched or can't be taken away is where so much of, of value exists. And so it's just, I'm, I'm trying to think and I'm running through my brain to try to understand that, but I can't think of something that, that I would have well, to take with me. I don't know. Well, what I, what I love is that <laughs> what you're really talking about, what you'd want to take with you is the memory, the value, the, his, the your history, uh, those values that your grandparents and others instilled in you. That's important. We're talking to Sergeant Jermaine Harris of the Chicago Police Department and uh, who oversees or works in community policing in Area 4. Uh Jermaine, let me ask you this in terms of, and this is really getting close to our final question. Uh, I'm curious as to um, what, uh, I mean, much of what you do in community policing in Area 4 is involving youth and sports programs. How do you get other officers engaged in the activities uh, and the kind of uh, approach that you take to keeping kids, the school to prison pipeline, keeping kids out of prison, keeping them engaged in sports and activities in that area. How do you engage other officers in that process? Yeah, I think one of the, the most important things that makes it successful is that I personalize it, right? It's one of those things with my own experience of being a youth coach and doing it now for 13 years. Um, one of the important parts that I, that, I'll, that I share with officers is what coaching did for me personally. So I, at about my maybe four or fifth year in policing, I actually contemplated quitting. Like I was really at that point because just the stress and the pressure and constantly being around just negative experiences was really eating at me. And so it was just by through again, through faith, through God, putting me in a place where I exactly needed to be at the exact time. My son turned five and he got old enough to play to play peewee football and, and t-ball. And so what happened is in taking him out there and trying to recreate my own experience, I got sucked into coaching. And so what that was, it, it provided an opportunity for me to see kids, see young people outside of the world of policing that I saw them in. So they weren't victims of crime. They weren't, you know, they weren't being abused. They weren't being neglected. They were playing sports. And so I got to see and be reminded of what reality was uh, with, with, with so, for so many young people. And so what I would do was use that to balance the light and the darkness, to be able to coach and go back. And so as I talk to officers, I share that personal experience with them to say, you, got, you have to find that thing that balances you, right? And if you're interested in sports, what better way than to pass that on to another kid or pass that on to a young person? And so that part is, is to kind of help personalize it in that way. But then the second thing that's really important is that these these approaches to getting officers to do things or trying to create reform or any type of change always works best from the inside out. So many, so much of things in policing comes from the outside in and it's hard to stick when people don't understand or can't relate or can't connect to the experiences. And that is no different than working with the community. The inside out approach works in all spaces, right? No matter what it, no matter if you're talking about community, policing, corporate, in any way. So when things come from the inter internally, and so that's what it comes from. It's a personal act from me to say, hey, I, I, I think you would be a great coach. Would you, can you do it? Can you join us? And that changes stuff, right? When that per that asking someone, you know, as the sort of someone as the sergeant or as someone that they trust or as a person who I built a, built a reputation and relationship with them, I think it means a little bit more than to see a flyer on a wall or see an advertisement or or to have a community organization ask them to do it. And so th th those two key things I think have really made it successful. 
And to the point now it's gotten that officers are asking, right, to put a word in for them so that they can coach next season. Or and it's something that they look forward to and it really um it and it, it, it's something that not only that the young people are benefiting from, but the officers themselves gain a lot of great positive um interactions and mental health support as well. I don't know if it was you or one of your other officers. I remember being in Chicago observing your program and some of the sports activities and uh, one of the officers said, you know, I knew things had changed when I got out of my squad car and several kids yelled, hey, coach, <laughs> um, that, you know, they saw a police officer fully decked out in all of his equipment and all the utility belts on and all of that goes with being a police officer in the streets of Chicago. And uh, they didn't see a police officer so much as they saw a coach. And I thought that was a powerful statement. Um, in terms of uh, how kids perceive what's going on in the local community. Sergeant yeah. Jermaine Harris, what a pleasure and privilege to talk with you. Your, the legacy you've inherited and what shaped you is now being translated into the values you bring into policing and you bring into the community in Chicago. I want to thank you for your time and being a part of this. And... Uh, I think we'll be following up with you for another interview at some point on some of the other aspects of your life. What a journey you've had. It's been a powerful journey. And uh, thank you for your time today. All right. Thank you so much for allowing me to share my story. To find out more information about this conversation and other Legacy Podcast episodes, go to ServantForge.org. Please subscribe to us on your favorite podcast app and consider leaving us a review. We want to hear from you. We want to get your ideas and your opinions. I have a new book that corresponds with a legacy project titled The Seeker, Bring Me the Horizon. You can find a copy of it on Amazon or your preferred book distributor. The book corresponds closely with these podcasts. The podcast episode was produced by Matt Erickson and edited by Carissa Erickson. The music is by David Hyde. Please look for a new episode of our podcast coming out soon. Remember, you have inherited a great legacy. You have an opportunity to create a great legacy. Engage your past to build a future. Mm -hmm.